Thank you, Mike. And your My name before. is Shannon. Oops, there we go. Got it. There we go. My name is Shannon Souza. I'm talking to you from a river just outside of Coos Bay, Oregon. I'm a fellow engineer. I studied mechanical engineering down at Santa Clara University, but actually sat for my boards here in Oregon way back in 1994 in environmental. Um, so I'm kind of a, a generalist and have had a sustainability consulting and contracting firm down here on the coast um, since 2000. So have a lot of common denominators with many of you. And before I jump into today's presentation about ocean and offshore wind and some other things we're tracking, I wonder if for my benefit, I'm just looking at the participants, if each of you might be willing to just drop in the chat um, who it is that you represent or if you're private practice or interested citizen, that's always exciting for me to see who else is, is logging on and tracking. And that might also help at the end of the presentations to facilitate answers to questions that you might have so I can better understand who y'all are. And I'm gonna jump in here. There's a lot to cover. Um, so I will be running through a lot of information. And I think that it makes sense for us to in general hold questions until the end because sometimes those questions that come up along the way will be answered a little bit later. Unless I put some slide up there and um, you see that there's a, a con the, the, the slide is telling you something that doesn't sound right or you're questioning what the source is. If there's anything like that, by all means, just unmute yourself, interrupt me and we'll take it from there. Let's see, there's a couple of things in the chat. Oh, awesome, you guys are all, all you folks are already responding. Okay, this is a, a beautiful photograph that a friend of mine took down um, on the coast in Curry County. It's absolutely fantastically beautiful. And the folks that live here were an odd bunch to get washed up here on the shore or blown over, um, whether it was generations ago or this, this generation. But some of the things that we all have in common are that we really cherish this area. And I give similar talks and presentations to folks all over the world, many of whom represent global industry that are interested in getting into Oregon's clean energy future. And I like to start with this picture and that little bit of context to put a human face on this, that while we are all understanding that we must because of climate, uh, the climate realities that we have contributed to move faster than we ever thought possible. And in the clean energy space, the renewables take up big footprints and are going into new areas. And we need to balance that rapidity, the, the rapidness with, with which we develop to responsibly honoring and understanding the local faces, priorities, cultures, concerns, ecologies, et cetera. So I'm going to give. I'm going to start talking about offshore wind because that's how Ocean start. The folks that are involved in Ocean started talking together. Um, a citizen down here on the coast, David Petrie, went up to one of BOEM Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. The I believe this is they are the wealthiest agency that we have in the nation. Um, they have an offshore wind task force group that has been meeting to develop areas off of our Oregon coast that could be made available to industry interested members of industry for leasing and developing offshore wind. And we had a citizen go up to that meeting two years ago now last September and come back down to the south coast and say, oh, why isn't anyone talking about this? What are we doing? What's going on? convened some public participation meetings and um, the, the organization has evolved from that beginning. I know that Michael Mitten is on this call too. He and I were both presenters at that initial public forum down here at our community college. So Offshore Wind was what brought us together. And as you'll see, um, as we go forward, Ocean has expanded its scope to include all clean coastal energy security type of projects. 
So the context of the timeline that is ticking, right now, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is working in this planning space and they're anticipating very early in 2022 to enter into this call for information and nominations. Basically what that means is they say, hey, we've drawn these big circles on the map of Oregon's coast. We're putting out a call to the globe. Is there anyone in industry that might be interested in developing renewable energy resources out there? Specifically, they're looking at floating offshore wind. To help facilitate both BOEM's work that they're doing in understanding which areas might be most suitable for development, and also to give us, any member of the, the global citizenry, access to the same information that they're using, and also allow us to tell them if we believe there are other data sets that they should be considering. This excellent map has been developed and it's live and it's available for you and they are taking input right now. What I've done is just taken screenshots from a couple of the various layers that they have developed. Um, our lead agency in Oregon is DSL or DLCD. They've been doing an amazing job with this and have been totally responsive. So if you get into these data sets and these layers and find that there are things missing or have questions, I highly encourage you. It's a very satisfying engagement with both of those entities. Now, minute, let me roll back to this image for a second here again. Um, here's Port Orford, this westernmost point here. And what we see is basically from Coos Bay south, and we'll see that in another slide, down to Eureka, Port of Eureka. We share absolutely um, unparalleled world-class wind resource. So it's highly plausible that those first circles are going to be drawn down south. At the same time, we have the Northwest Power Plan. The draft 2021 power plan has been issued. We've been talking to staff for over two years about this plan now. Approached staff back in September of 2000, or maybe it was that 18, no, 19 to talk about offshore wind and uh, because we had caught wind, pun intended, that it was not included in the scenario developments. They, um, they use software, planning software, of course, to plan all of the developments and project both what the load needs for resource adequacy are going to be and what the resources might be that could be developed to meet those needs. And they run different sets of scenarios through that to come up with their recommendations to council for which one of those plans should be their roadmap going forward. That's what's out on the street right now. In all of those plans, they have a spot for emerging technology. These are technologies that have not been, they're not up and, and running right now. They haven't been part of previous plans, but it's a proxy for any clean or now it's clean because of our all of our state clean energy goals, but any resource that might be considered in scenario development. We learned that offshore wind was not included there and we wanted to know why and if it was too late to be included. They chose as a proxy nuclear, specifically because at the time they had two staff members working on emerging technology, Jillian Charles, who's still there. And if you come to this afternoon's hearing for um, Oregon, you'll, I think you'll see from her as well as Ben Kujala. But Jillian was working with the nuclear industry to understand that emerging technology. And New Scale, which is an Oregon-based company, provided staff with a really nice, clean proxy scenario that was pretty much packaged and they could uplift into their software. On the other hand, the offshore wind industry did not provide staff with that. And worse than that is that the staffer who was focusing on and working with offshore wind industry on this was hired by Avangrid, an offshore wind developer, and is now working for them on the Eastern Seaboard. That will certainly be part of our comment this afternoon to make sure that the full council and everyone is, is aware of that, that they have as an emerging 
technology right now represented um, a nuclear technology that has never been put into practice anywhere on the globe, while offshore wind, even floating offshore wind, is currently put in play and in fact helps Scotland through its hurricanes and supply energy to that aisle. For context of just what we're up against, here's a slide from one of the workshops that staff has been holding to keep everyone up to speed. We have a lot of renewables to build, a lot of renewables to build. Um, there we're calling for roughly 600 gigawatts of new resources to be acquired across the WEC here by 2028. To put that in context, right now, we have 270 gigawatts of clean resources. The draft that's out right now, if you were to just meet the needs through clean energy resources without any storage to help you balance, they'd be looking for 600 gigawatts of clean energy. Uh, that's by 2051. So we um, definitely have our work cut out for us. <clears throat> A lot of the demand for all of these electrons you know, we are cutting, Oregon actually is a leader in the nation in energy efficiency. We've been doing a good job at that for a long time. Green hydrogen requires clean electrons and green hydrogen is really showing up as what is going to enable us to not only decarbonize, uh, not only as a, a resilience, kind of a balancing ballast factor in our grid in that we can generate green hydrogen and use fuel cells as backup electricity in emergency systems or otherwise, but it also can transition into the clean fuels. So now we're talking about replacement of other fuels and in the agricultural sector for renewable um, ammonia, which is an, another step down. So we're looking as we look forward for a lot of green hydrogen and because of Oregon's offshore wind resource, as you'll see later, for offshore wind to supply a lot of those electrons. Um, you've seen these slides, so I won't go too far into them. Good news about the Northwest Power Pool and this giant resource adequacy market that we are very rapidly stepping into is that while currently none of the metrics and none of the um, mechanisms for projecting future demands and for validating um, anticipated resources available to meet those demands, currently uh, they're kind of apples and oranges. Everyone's siloing what they're doing and they're not in any case, in many cases, using the same data sets or assumptions. That will very likely change very quickly in the next two years as we move forward into a voluntary resource adequacy market. Um, we definitely at Ocean and Poet have some concerns about how those capacity contribution valuations will proceed there. We've been working very hard at the state level with our PUC and the capacity docket and now the resource adequacy docket to um, advocate for modern valuation methods. And as we step into the power pool, now we have a private sector program manager who will be developing those capacity valuations, whether they're ELCC or other. So stand by for potential engagement in that sector as well. The detailed design is um, out on the street, of course, and definitely that's another opportunity for comment. But as detailed as it says, um, it's woefully black box when it comes to capacity contributions. Time horizons, I'm gonna cruise through these because you all are up to speed on that. Um, here's where we sit right now. Oregon is an energy importer. This slide is slightly out of date, but the big picture is really the same. Um, we have, we're still importing a lot of dirty energy. I'm sitting out at the end of Pacific Core's line, which still has a lot of coal in it. Because of um, our recent clean energy bill that was passed, we know that Oregon now also will be joining its neighbors to the south and the north in helping to encourage the 
retirement of non-clean generation sources. So all of these big, huge dots that are coal and natural gas and petroleum uh, products will be retired, or in the case of natural gas, perhaps they will transition over to hydrogen production. Last May, in, to help um, specifically the, the stated uh, focus of this study was to provide um, information to policymakers in the state of Oregon. Evolved Energy Resource was contracted to conduct Oregon's clean energy pathways analysis. I represented OCEAN on that technical review committee and the results of that were published last May. Um, the big picture finding is that we're seeing a lot of offshore winds, specifically off of Oregon, that's absolutely necessary to balance the Western grid. And I like to think of it as an outrigger to the Western grid. We've got all of the traditional, we've got all the, the terrestrial, solar, hydro, and wind. And when we look at the resource and the load and the timing, um, the offshore wind resource is a beautiful complement to naturally balance those. Just what kinds of volumes we're talking about? We're talking about 20 gigawatts off of Oregon shore. And the only reason that they stopped at 20 gigawatts, because at that level, then the electrons that are actually feeding on to the transmission system require a whole other level of magnitude in transmission system upgrades. However, I did let the, um, the folks that did this analysis and that will be repeating a similar analysis, this is the same um, contractor that does work for the Northwest Power and Conservation Planning Council. And as you'll see in their drafts, if you have, if you've seen the, the draft 2021 plan, they are including um, some, some of the climate change aspects, decarbonization requirements into their scenario development. And what they're bringing forward in this plan was based on work that this same group, Evolved Energy, did for the power planning staff in evaluating pathways to decarbonization in the Pacific Northwest. It's a bit dated. And they just did this work for us here in Oregon around our clean energy pathways. So they're now scoping up their scenarios and their sensitivities for returning to the Pacific Northwest and updating their decarbonization plan. So we made sure to provide them with some updated information um, on just what is and isn't possible out there. At any rate, um, this reference case you can throw out the window because it was included um, previous to Oregon passing its clean energy standard. So in any of these viable, and of course we're at 100% by 40, this is 100% by 50. So we're even more aggressive. And I believe that what we will see is that these timelines will be accelerated to meet our more aggressive goals, not to mention our national goals. So what the heck, what's this big opportunity? Um, this is from one of NREL's maps that they put together. And what we're looking at here is wind resource. The richer the red, the richer the resource. So here's, remember that's Port Orford, actually the, the westernmost point on the continental United States. And up here is Coos Bay. And here is San Francisco, where all of um, the wealthy people that need a lot of electricity live. So when Michael and I first met, and I was scratching my head, going, this is an offshore wind, and talking to developers and folks about it, and when's Oregon going to get in the game? What we heard was, no wind's going to be developed off of Oregon's coast until we have additional high voltage DC transmission. And likely it's going to need to be offshore. That's going to take forever. We're talking about $5 billion plus. Um, so it's way off in the future. This study that was published in May 2020, that was paid for by BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, 
they hired our Pacific um, National Labs to do this study, actually found something different, which is that Oregon's existing transmission system without reconductoring can accommodate two to three gigawatts of offshore wind. That completely changes the dialogue. One, it can strengthen Oregon's coastal grids. Um, I'm talking to you from a part of the coast that has its very own chapter in Oregon's resilience plan. No other region has its very own chapter. <laughs> they don't really know how to help us recover yet. So we're coming up with lots of great ideas for them. This is a focus. An offshore wind provides the opportunity for the South Coast, um, allowing for additional renewable energy integration from the East. What does that mean? Right now, as many of you know, we are transmission constrained and our terrestrial renewable energy large scale projects are having a hard time figuring out just how they can get in the lineup. Um, since we are currently importing and existing plans are to increase imports from the east into our state of renewable energy to meet our objectives. The highway is kind of full, a traffic jam out there. But what, what Pacific Northwest National Labs found is that if we reverse that flow, at least from the coast, um, and can produce all of the coast needs, it's, a, it's about 600 megawatts is what the average coastal demand for a net zero coast would be but then push the electrons backwards through the transmission system that runs through the coast range to the I-5 corridor, then we can alleviate even more of those imports. And that frees up additional transmission capacity that could be used for more terrestrial renewables to be built in Oregon. Um, and of course, we reduce our power flows into Oregon. So this, this was a very big deal. It also found that, as I alluded to earlier, the offshore wind resource and timing and um, intensity is a beautiful complement to our existing and projected resource mix portfolio stacks that we've got going, as well as our existing and projected load profiles as we move farther and farther into climate change. So here's today's picture. Oregon's ratepayers send dollars outside of the state, um, oftentimes for investor-owned utilities to use those dollars to build their own facilities in other states. And then we rely on the transmission system to deliver that to us. So put simply, this is a slide that I used in one of my um, testimonies to the Senate Environment and um, Energy Committee last year to just make it really clear for legislators what we're talking about. If we start developing our own resources, we can flip that picture and Oregon can actually not only provide its own electricity, but eventually become a clean energy exporter to the entire region. We had some really supportive state legislation passed last session, all of which stacks up to um, more opportunities for us to engage and hopefully opportunities for us to at the end of the day end up with more steel in the ground and out in the water in the form of renewable energy that's been built and installed by Oregonians. The RTO study bill is well underway at Department of Energy. Um, there's a little resource adequacy authority question that's going to go through PCO, a PUC docket. The renewable hydrogen study bill is active at ODO. And we have our offshore wind three by 30, three gigawatts by 2030 planning bill that's active that you helped us get across the finish line with your supportive testimony, written testimony. Thank you. House Bill 3375 uh, was a primary focus of OCEAN with our partners at POET and Representative David Brock Smith down here on the South Coast. It set a new national, certainly a national precedent, if not globally, in that it didn't just say to the state, hey, you better get ready to receive these developers. It said to the state, we want you to plan for this in a manner that actually maximizes the benefits to this state and our citizens, and specifically looks ahead 
um, to identifying how we can minimize conflicts between this technology and our ocean ecosystem and our ocean users. That study is underway and Jason Searman will be providing his report back to legislators in September of 22. Offshore wind, um, we've been inserting it into the conversations of agencies and it's slowly grafting. <laughs> they see that it's happening. Um, with the exception of DLCD, who knows all, all too much that it's happening and has a very strong leadership role. Over at the PUC Commission, we brought offshore wind and the opportunity and specifically the findings of that PNNL report to the capacity value, valuation docket UM 2011, which hopefully is scheduled to wrap with consensus around recommendations for um, capacity valuation in December. I'm smiling because that'll be a really interesting meeting. But those of us stakeholders have been at this for two and a half years now. So we'll see how that consensus document looks. Resource adequacy is just unfolding here in the state of Oregon. And of course, we're all trying to jive and align with what's going on at the Northwest Power Pool. Um, our state commissioners at the PUC have definitely, especially um, Tawny and Decker, have definitely been involved in the Northwest Power Pool. So that connection is being made there. And I was asked by staff to put together a briefing on offshore wind because I wouldn't shut up about it in all of these dockets. <laughs> so on the 22nd and the 29th, these are not open public meetings. These are staff briefings, um, but we've put together a robust um, lineup of presenters from our national labs, industry, um, federal agencies, and state agencies, and poet and ocean. Department of Energy, uh, we have our Oregon Renewable Energy Siting Assessment, ORESA. That's the US Department of Defense funded study that should be wrapping here, um, I think around June of 22. So we've been engaging with, the, with them for the last two years on that. And this week and next, they have their industry workshops. That work is going to have two products. One of them is going to be a GIS map, uh, another super cool open source planning tool that we all have access to and we are definitely engaging in that. The idea is to avoid conflicts between renewable energy project siting and other users and other priorities. So thank you US Department of Defense for funding this work. And of course, we're working with staff on the implementation of House Bill 3375. And if you're wondering how interested industry is, I am also under contract with Pacific Ocean Energy Trust. That's a 501c3 public benefit um, group that actually used to be a state agency, OWET. And we have founded an industry advisory group for offshore wind. So these are folks from industry who are investing dollars and time in helping POET to strategize engagement in the policy space, specifically around offshore wind. And as you can see, we've got some big kids on the block that are definitely at the table. So now ocean, who are we? What are we doing? Ocean is... Um, a, a cross-cultural group down here on the coast that is looking at advanced energy technology and developments and projects and asking ourselves how we do that balance. How do we, how do we balance a rapid response with a responsible response? And what we've done is model another organization that's been really successful down here on the coast, Coos Watershed, or um, association. And they work in the habitat restoration space. And they found early on, while their focus was on um, protecting our national, our, our fisheries habitat, and obviously clean water to watershed association, they recognized that the timber and the ag industries were those who are the landholders and the adjacent users. So they specifically grew their board 
by reaching out to those industries and soliciting leaders to sit on their board. So everything that they do is kind of framed up from a path of least resistance, minimized conflicts, and greatest benefits. So we thought, cool, let's do that. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about our board complexion, but our, the leadership of our board co complexion is to do just that, to tap, reach out who's, which, which stakeholders out on the coast will be most deeply touched by clean energy project development or a lack thereof, and invite them to help steer the ship and ask the questions and provide the input. As you can kind of sense from the legislation that we passed, we are taking a whole different approach to project development. Many of us that serve at Ocean, whether I'm a, a pro bono executive director, some of us have had um, decades of experience working on the industry side around project development and working with agencies in the permitting processes as well as eventually the public comment process that's um, baked into those permitting processes. And this is a, a cool diagram that our friend Bill Henry came up with to help us, you know, just kind of summarize what the deal is. As you all know that this traditional uh, project development where over in the need statement, either there's um, an economic opportunity that industry recognizes or elected leaders or other agencies or communities identify, hey, we have this need and we really need, it, need for it to be met. And it's just those folks, those initial folks that have that idea that do all of this brainstorming and testing out, what is it that we want? What would it look like if, from our perspective, ideally? There's not a whole lot of external participation. That's when the project's really, really pliable and is most efficiently shaped because the farther we go, the more money we spend, the more ideas get baked in, the harder it is to change projects. Then they kind of move into this first contact of socialization, um, you know, maybe engagement with some real high up leaders from some of those stakeholders that have been identified. And then the formal proposal hits the street. You've got more of the leaders. Maybe now you've got um, a po potential opponents that are showing up that weren't previously engaged. And by the time we get to the EIS part of the project, where the outreach, now the agency has its 90 day comment periods and its public hearings, the project's fairly well baked. Um, and sometimes things go well and sometimes they don't. It can take a long time and oftentimes you have a higher um, likelihood of litigation at the end of the day. We're seeing some of that play out on the East Coast currently. So knowing that and not getting in the way of that traditional approach that all of our permitting state and federal mechanisms are set up around, what OCEAN is doing is simultaneously pursuing another approach to say, we want as many people and stakeholders to understand what's going on right now. We want to share uh, knowledge between industry and stakeholders and our electeds about what community priorities are, um, about what technology is capable of. What are the bottom line elements that need to be hit by industry in order for these investments to go forward? Where's the workforce coming from? How can we start to plan for this so that we can maximize and multiply those benefits to the very communities that these projects will occur in while we minimize conflicts in those same communities, as well as with industry and the investors and the agencies that are also engaged. So it's kind of a, a flip. And the idea is that by the time you get to this you know, this, this broader permitting phase that more of those who will be deeply touched by these projects have already had an opportunity not only to submit comment, but hopefully to help shape the project. A note caller.
Back to our board, uh, we specifically reached out to identify it. Okay, who, who do we, who are the players? Who's going to be making the decisions? Who's going to be impacted? We, we want them on board, literally. So um, Sam over here, he's the chair of Coos Bay Surfrider that raised a lot of eyebrows for legislators that we had Surfrider um, support for our planning bill. We have, he's also a, an independent fisher, fisher. He's got a, a boat that chases tuna all the time. Um, Robert Westerman's, so we have our, our local IBEW and today we were on the call with their international representative for region nine, which includes all of the Pacific states and Idaho and Nevada. Kyle Stevens, he's the governor's most recent appointee to the commission for the Port of Coos Bay. He's also the executive director for Southwestern Oregon Workforce Investor, Investor Board, and he's a card carrying longshoreman, go figure. Newt Neatmuth is a retired commercial fisherman. He's also very much engaged in Charleston, which is Coos Bay's fishing community, the second most um, the, the second highest cat, highest value catch port is Newport and then Coos Bay for the state fishing industry. Jamie Faraday, he serves on Oregon's Ocean Policy Advisory Council. And by the way, DLCD um, posted their projected policy um, work for the next two years. And there's a lot of work in there to be reviewing their territorial sea plan that's, that's where Oregon gets its, um, starts to get its say as developers respond to the call and start bidding on leases and then moving forward through the permitting process. Bill Gorham is a leader in South, um, uh, Southern Oregon Climate Action Now, SOCAN, which is um, also inland and out on the coast. He's also a retired marine biologist, um, has his doctorate, and used to be hired by industry, specifically the oil industry, to work with BOEM on these projects. So it's nice to have that. He's um, actually the chair of our environmental subcommittee. Bill Bradbury is a retired secretary of state and state, rep state representative. He also served as our, one of our two Oregon representatives to the Northwest Power Planning Conservation Council. And Alyssa Pruis is a super, super go-getter. Um, she's a librarian by official training, but her specialty is reaching out to underrepresented and underserved communities. She does a lot of work with Coos County Health and Wellness. She's also to be soon the president of our local chapter of Zonta. That's an international women-led um, organization for community benefit. Been around for a long time. Amelia Earhart was one of their members, for example. So she's very much networked there. Um, Jeff Hill is a 35-year-old, 35-year seasoned veteran of the maritime community, and he's representing Sauce Brothers down here. We're also in conversations with two tribal, two tribes to get um, one of their tribes to agree to appoint a counselor. It's not that they have problems with our mission, it's that they have problems with time management. Um, we do have memberships that are available. available. That kind of, uh, we have a very unique uh, membership design. Our membership is, is available to anyone. There are individual memberships, there are nonprofits, and there are for-profits. ESF and OCEAN are both nonprofits, so we exchange memberships free to each other. And what that does is it means that uh, a representative for ESF is invited to any of our member meetings, including committee meetings, and we have a very active policy um, meeting sector that will be reactivating here. If there are members, whether they're from for-profit, nonprofit, or individuals that don't actually reside on the Oregon coast, and there's some kind of a lack of consensus in one of our policy statements or strategies, or just in the overall organization and running of the organization, 
Non-coastal members don't have a vote. If we have to take something to a vote, they don't have a vote. Um, so that's the difference. Only coastal ent entities. We want to make sure that even as industry steps up and becomes involved and, and wants to help with our mission, that at the end of the day, if there is something that's contentious um, or there's potential issue, that it's those folks and organizations that are out on the coast that are making the final decision. We've divided up our work into education and advocacy work. I'm gonna just power through these to say we've been busy. We're talking to a lot of organizations that will be touched by clean energy and letting them know what's going on. We're also very active as panelists and moderators in the clean energy space um, in the Pacific Northwest and nationally. We have monthly webinars and um, would love to get more input from you all about uh, topics that you would see would be of value. We've been very successful in bringing in global leaders from agencies, industries, and other nonprofits to share what they know. And we've been really busy in our advocacy. Well, you'll get the slide deck, so if you're interested, you'll see that your name's on here. Um, you helped us pass a bill. And I think this is really worth noting for those that pay attention to Oregon's uh, legislation, to have a clean energy bill that wasn't partisan. In fact, we had full unanimous support off of the House floor for this bill. So that approach of early engagement for those who would be touched most deeply by these projects seems to be working out legislatively. And we have a growing coalition of organizations that we're working with. So our strategy this year, um, this is in responding to active conversations. Of course, the draft 2021 plan, providing comment for BOEM. Um, I was appointed by Oregon's Director of Energy to serve on the Regulatory Advisory Council for a new program in the Clean um, Energy Bill. There was $50 million that was set up for the Community Renewable Energy Program. Mm -hmm. And that specifically is looking for uh, public and tribal ownership of projects with preference given to those that have a resilience aspect to them. We're participating on a steering committee. POET has started the Pacific Ocean Transmission Solutions Think Tank that involves members of California Energy Commission and the Schatz Institute, um, former um, employee of BPA and, and some others. I think that there are probably some on this call that might be interested in getting involved in that as we move beyond steering into a larger organization. And we're providing comments on Pacific Corps' draft distribution system planning updates that should be filed in three days. For our own, those are all conversations that we're not, that we're not sharing, but um, for our own mission, we're just trying to grow our membership, want to expand policy committee participation. We have three very, we have some really active pushes this year or this week in the upcoming weeks around existing grant funding opportunities we're advocating for a Pacific State Memorandum of Understanding between California, Oregon, and Washington to collaborate on strategies so that we can multiply those benefits and minimize those conflicts. Specifically, socially, what role does um, clean energy and specific, you know, let's talk about offshore wind and green hydrogen as the emerging ones. What roles can they play in our resilience how can they be developed so they don't, um, so they actually strengthen uh, cultures of the coast? Our labor supply chain, port functions, and ecosystems. We are also um, seeking funding for um, to, to develop a scenario analysis for that three gigawatts by 2030, and including 500 megawatts of electrolysis with a lens for that maximizing benefits, minimizing conflicts to Oregon's coast. And we're also working on a scenario analysis for Coos Bay as a green hydrogen hub. We're strengthening our labor collect, um, collaborations as well as tribal. And 
Um, yep, I double. I, we're so excited about the green hydrogen hub. I added it twice. So let's see. We can. Those. That's our. We have our webinars. Talked about that. Um, we are also, and I would be happy to return if you are interested to share information specific to the funding of projects, clean energy funding projects, um, from the FEMA standpoint, as well as the state standpoint. These are all different mechanisms that OCEAN is seeking funding to um, be able to implement in terms of expanding our engagement. And getting to the cutting to the chase, how can we work together? You're, you're all a partner organization. So um, whoever you designate as your representative, you'll get invited to our committee meetings if you're interested. And as we have in the past, hopefully we can offer letters of support for each other um, for grant applications or other work that we're doing. We can sign on to and collaborate with one another in our testimony and comments and public proceedings. You bring a, a broader breadth and depth in various areas that we yeah. frankly don't have. And any of your individuals, of course, we would love it if you would click the link and connect, connect um, contribute to our cause, both financially and as individuals um, to help us better understand the opportunities in front of us. So I'm finally going to stop talking <laughs> and open it up for questions. OK, from Trish Weber, is there a simple way to sum up the implications of offshore wind for the existing federal dams as power sources, especially the Snake River dams, given that future drought will decrease the dam's generation capacity. Um, it's, there's not a simple way to sum that up, but you've really hit at just one of the many values that there are in connecting the dots between the staff at uh, Power and Conservation Planning Council with our national labs because our national labs, um, one, one, of the, one of the points of advocacy that I'll be making on behalf of POET and OCEAN this afternoon with them is that they do expand, increase the resources for staff um, at the Power Council, as well as dedicate resources to updating their planning software and to integrating those with the best practices that are currently underway and in play at our national labs, as well as in the private sector in some cases, like the work that Evolve Energy. But they know, the Power Council, that as um, in response to climate change, those are some of the, that's one of the scenario sensitivities that they're running. And the specific issue of the functioning of our hydroelectric system, um, that's the biggest piece of that puzzle that they are grappling with. And when they are able to uplift modern third-party vetted data sets and mechanisms for evaluating resources like we have from PNNL in the case of offshore wind and green hydrogen, then they can look at those trade-offs. How do these new resource mixes help us to um, continue to provide a, a robust grid as our previously readily available hydro system evolves. Um, this is Trish. Thank you so much for that really fantastic answer. And just following up super quickly, I'd love to um, touch base with you afterwards to find out where is a good place for additional information about the economic viability of like the Snake River Dam? Some, some great research has come out in the last couple of months, but I don't know if it might have made, it, made its way into the hands of the planners. And mm. um, if you can, yeah, I'd love to talk to you about just who to connect up on that so that the information gets shared. Yes, absolutely. I'm just dropping my my email into the chat if anyone has any threads that you'd like to follow up on. 
please do. I'm going backwards through the comments, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, reading these. Uh, is there another? There are cost advantages, this was from Conrad. There are cost advantages to keeping some nuclear in the mix for a grid with mostly wind and solar. Totally understood. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't that we were pushing back on the concept of nuclear so much outright, but that in the decision making process for which proxy would be included, it seems that offshore wind is more emergent in that it's it's actually up and functioning. The other wrinkle there is, and particularly. And with the backdrop of the Northwest Power Pool, and we're all swapping and sharing resources, uh, Oregon's, you, you can't build nuclear in Oregon, and it's not really clear to me, maybe someone else on this call knows, but with our new clean energy standards, can, can, does nuclear fit within that description of the resources that we can draw from? So in the case where we might have jurisdictions within that Northwest Power Plan that ex explicitly prohibit consumption of certain resources, um, you know, does it, does it make sense to continue including? Ironically enough, Representative um, Brock Smith down here down south, that's something that we arm wrestle about. He's a he's a Republican. He's a ranking Republican with a lot of leadership, specifically in the climate conversations. Um, and obviously, we work together because he he's supporting oceans efforts and our missions, and he's very supportive of a nuclear inclusion inclusive portfolio. I'm skeptical, uh, Adam, I'm skeptical of green hydrogen's ability to be a cost-effective resource in the near to mid-range future without some unforeseen technical breakthroughs. It's interesting to watch how quickly that is moving. Renewable Hydrogen Association is another um, partnering organization with Ocean. And they invited um, me as Ocean to moderate a panel up at a symposium they held in Tacoma last August, two months ago, and it was the uh, Renewables to Clean Fuels Symposium. And I was blown away by how quickly the technology is developing and the projects. The Tacoma Power was the first in the nation to voluntarily issue a special tariff for clean fuels. The Port of Tacoma is moving forward with um, well, there's a huge hydrogen hub that's being proposed there and very likely to be at the top of the list for EDA funding, um, because right now we have a surplus of hydroelectricity up there that they can get started with. They're looking at port decarbonization as their first priority um, because it's a, it's a smaller nut to crack, but involved in that is the electrolysis and then fuel cells that's mobile, it's on a container, it's got like 800 megawatts for 48 hours. Blew my mind that they can take from one berth to another for shore support, but you can also stick that on a ferry and take it up to one of the islands um, to supply island and islanded communities. Very interesting. I started my day last Friday with Siemens Corporation. Um, they're, inter they're international. They have the global affairs on there to talk to us, to me, about the level of readiness of that technology. Um, they're very, very ready to roll. There's right now an RFP out in Scotland for two gigawatts of offshore wind, and they have a one gigawatt of electrolysis um, to, to meet that offshore wind. Um, they've got electrolysis units that are up and running and are ready to arrive on our coast as soon as we sign the PO. <laughs> Portland Metro um, on the terrestrial side, they've got their, um, I can't remember what their pilot project is, but I wanna say it's 600 buses in pretty short order 
and they're developing their own electrolysis units. So you'll see those uh, and they've, they have received funding. So those are going to be up and out the door very quickly. Um, and what was the other point I wanted to make? I have learned, and I alluded to this, but the, the biggest driver and where we're seeing a lot of additional um, technology cost drops um, in, in green hydrogen is that when we then convert it to green ammonia, we have a huge market. We just, it just we just the, the royal we the globe as we're looking for how we decarbonize. Period and moving beyond energy and transportation in the agricultural sector, we're making a lot of ammonia from petroleum products and renewable ammonia uh, is a huge, huge, huge market. We've had three developers now contact us down here in Coos Bay to say, hey, I heard you have some offshore wind. Can we have 500 megawatts? Which is where we came up with the target for the state planning legislation. So um, it's uh, there's a lot of work going on there and I don't think we're we're over out on a limb on that one. But that's exactly why Ocean is advocating for um, the development of a planning concept around an offshore wind hub in Coos Bay. Who would those <laughs> off-takers be? How expensive is that process? And what does that market look like? Uh -huh. Shannon, uh, you are right on top of one o'clock here. Uh, I sense that it may be time for you to prepare for your next meeting or, or do you, is there any burning thing that needs to be done uh, before we sign off? I need to say thank you all for your time. Um, it's nice to virtually meet you. Hopefully next time I won't be doing all of this talking and at some point in the not too distant future, we could even see each other in person. That'd be amazing. So if you, you get out to the coast and would like to connect, you've got my email, please send me a line and any of these topics that I touched on um, that you'd like to get more engaged in what we're doing, please reach out. Thank you, Shannon. You've certainly given me a lot to think about. And uh, if anyone wants a professional de development hour credit for this, attending this, please uh, uh, send me an email at mikeunger at comcast.net. Uh, thank you all for attending.